Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Shorts, London Symphonietta's lockdown live series in which London Symphonietta players play music live from their own homes to you, the audience at home. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. It really is wonderful that there's an audience for live music making in this incredibly weird time, and we're so grateful that you're here. Thank you. You may excitingly have noted that there is a live chat window on this YouTube screen. You are very, very welcome to uh, send us in your comments and questions during the show, as long as they're constructive. And um, there's going to be a Q&A session at the end of the show when you will get to put your questions to today's composers and performer, who are Paul Silverthorne, who's going to be playing music by Ben Foskett and Sally Beamish. All three are waiting backstage in the Symphonietta Zoom green room as we speak. But before we hear from them, you should know that this series of Symphonietta shorts has been supported by the wonderful Lark Music, an insurance broker who also look after my cello. Thank you so much, Lark Music, for making this possible. And also, big thanks go to the Arts Council, who underpins so much of what Symphonietta do, and to the trusts, sponsors, and individuals who have kept the ship afloat. But I think maybe the biggest thanks have to go to the musicians themselves, who, at this time when none of us know when concert halls are going to be opening again, or when the next really live concerts with live audiences are going to be in a concert hall, or other venues, they are still practicing their craft, keeping standards up so that they can deliver music to you at home. So huge thanks to the musicians themselves. Sinfonietta is hoping very much to keep this wonderful series going in the autumn and it's looking for support to make that happen. And with this supporty kind of theme in mind, we would be so hugely grateful if any of you at home are in a position where you might be able to give us a little donation today. It doesn't matter how small, but if you're able, the suggested donation is that of a concert ticket, kind of Wednesday afternoon concert type ticket. And to do that, you can go on the London Symphonietta website, which is www.londonsymphonietta.com dot org dot uk or on this youtube link now and with huge thanks for your generosity and while you're at it do have a look actually at the symphonietta digital channel which has been masterminded by the incredible adam flynn who you can't see but is lurking behind the zoom camera somewhere there's an amazing collection of recordings master classes performances chats on that channel as there are on the YouTube channel for London Symphonietta. So if you haven't already, do subscribe. There's some fabulous stuff on there. Right, I think that's enough of me talking. It's time for you lot to meet today's team. Paul Silverthorne, Sally Beamish and Ben Foskett. Are you there? Hello, everybody. Hello. Yes. Yes, Paul. <laughs> Hello, good, it's working. Um, Paul, I'm going to go to you first. Hello there. How are you doing in lockdown? How's it all going? Well, frankly, I've been very grateful to have a project like this to keep me practicing because it would be so easy to just go into gardening and cooking and all the other things that one could do. And uh, two very challenging pieces in their different ways and, and both fascinating and I'm really thrilled to be playing them. It's even better to have the composers to talk about it for me and for, and for everybody else. And um, so to start with, with Ben, with whom I had a very nice conversation earlier in the week talking about the piece. Hi, Ben. Hello, how are you doing? Hi, I'm fine. Good, good to see you. And you're, you're down in France at the moment. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of the countryside doing gardening, in fact. How very lovely. You've been gardening. Right, there we are. Gardening leaves, they call it, don't they? So, this piece was actually commissioned by the London Symphonietta, wasn't it? Four Impressions, it's called. Um, presumably the brief at the time was to write a short piece for a solo instrument, specifically viola. And that was probably as far as the brief went. Is that right? Um, I think so. I can't remember if I chose viola or not. I think I might have actually chosen it. Um, I can't quite remember why, but I think it's partly to do with the... At the, at the time, the, the sound of the instrument was 
was sort of inspiring me in the way that uh, the resonance of the instrument and the sound of how it works and uh, the timbre of it and especially the sort of the grainy timbre that you get from working quite close to an instrument. I do quite a lot of recording sessions and and creating virtual instruments and uh, and so it's sort of drawn me closer and closer to the sound and I think uh, especially this sound which is th that dominates this piece which is very saltasto almost on the edge of where you can put the bow as close to your fingers as you can go without actually uh, sort of touching them or, or not being able to play the string accurately um, which gives a very very wispy grainy and slightly uh, uh, unstable sound um, so I think the, the sort of basis of the piece is just that the the sound this very specific sound the instrument makes um, and then I had to sort of work out how that actually creates a piece um, so um, I sort of started working on little ideas um, just of things that that seem to give that resonance um, and that sort of bore the first sort of interlude or the first what became the interludes to the impressions and also the introduction. Um, yeah, can I, sorry, um, yeah. I've often heard that com many composers do their best work when they're given limited resources and it seems that in this piece you've deliberately limited yourself in the timbre by, by concentrating entirely on the, the very saltasto sound and also you've been very restrictive on your actual pitches haven't you you've not given yourself a full range of, of notes you haven't even given yourself a full scale and i think this is fascinating that you've 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 deliberately worked in a very limited way and i think that gives it's one of the things that often gives a great strength to a piece rather than just throwing everything including the kitchen sink into it which <laughs> we often get is that, is yeah, that well, something that, you feel yeah, I mean, the idea was to create, it was, because it comes from that very specific sound, the idea was just to make that sound last the length of a piece. And obviously I don't want that just to be one note, because um, it's it sort of, as it's, it, it had so much, uh, had so much effect, you, I just wanted to create the atmosphere around that to make it last, which didn't need to stray very far, because once the piece becomes too dramatic or if there's too much development, we we're, we're sort of broken out of that sound world and we and we lose it so yeah the i mean the the introduction and, and that comes back in between each piece as interludes stays exactly the same at the end it, it goes up the octave but that stays exactly the same and all the all the sort of impressions are really just impressions which are almost like reminiscences of sound and just ways of I suppose creating an atmosphere around the sound and giving a direction to to the piece. Well, I think. It, sorry, Paul. I'll let you carry I was just on. Say, we just need to touch on the on the use of quarter tones in this piece, yes. which not everybody's familiar with. Um, what I, what's fascinating here is nearly all the time you you combine the quarter tones with with what one might want to call normal pitches. And clearly, from what you've been saying, that also accentuates the kind of um, distancing of the sound, which the bowing does, but it also stops the natural resonance and produces a different kind of resonance in the instrument. Yeah, I really, I really mean? like the, the resonance of, the, of harmony in quarter tones and the way that mm. changing one of the notes, for example, in a, in a major chord then or putting a quarter tone flat note with the bass as a bass to a major chord actually changes completely how we appreciate the sound and the timbre of the sound. Um, so with this piece, I wanted to do the same thing. And so we have, there's quite a bit of double stopping, but in order that it really resonates in the instrument and also is playable in quarter tones, there's a lot of um, open strings, which then are put against stopped strings, giving us a sort of, yes. which also limits where the instrument can go and where the piece can go. 
because you're you're stuck with the four strings as your open strings, and then you're playing chord tones against those, um, mm. which also creates a nice limiting factor and a and a nice sort of uh, I suppose focal point within the piece. You're always you're always coming back to the four open strings, but not as we normally hear them as one string against the other as a nice bright fifth. It's always this sort of very um, m complex sound. Well, I think we In fact, should. You used the phrase the other day. Sorry, um, that the open string effectively grounds the chord. Yeah, has a grounding effect. Anyway, yeah, and it yes, helps. Yes, it, Zoe, it helps. we should move on. <laughs> 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 Well, I think we shouldn't um, talk for longer than the duration of the piece. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking uh, before about the joys of Zoom and the speaker view and uh, the very strange effect it's having on all of our lives. So, Paul, I'll just let you get ready and we'll do a kind of um, we were, I was going to just do a general introduction to see how you're all doing in lockdown. But tell you what, Sally, we're going to come to you after we've heard Ben's piece. How about that? And Ben, while Paul is just getting the viola warmed up in that Zoom square, um, just tell us, where are you right now? I'm in my house in the middle of France. Um, and whereabouts in France? It's in the Creuse, which is a very rural area of France where there's... I think it's probably the second least populated area of the of France. It's Which sounds 20... like it suits you, right? You said this is the first time you've used Zoom because actually you don't want to see anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I like seeing people, but uh, not too many. Anyway. Yeah, spoken but, uh... like a true composer. <laughs> no, this we've we've been here and I've just been uh, taking time in between looking after my my son and doing a little bit of work and uh, gardening so it's been uh, it's been okay I've been quite productive in fact I've got quite a lot of work done and on various different projects so it's been fantastic uh, well it's great you could join us today and um, now that Paul has given us a, a kind of foundation of a little bit of what we were going to hear um, let's hear it. So this is going to be Four Impressions by Ben. We'll talk more about it afterwards.
Thank you so much, Paul. That was Four Impressions by Ben Foskett. And uh, that was Paul Silverthorne playing that piece. Ben, um, can you remind us when the first performance of that happened? This was commissioned for Sinfonietta, wasn't it? Yeah, it was on one of the Wednesday lunchtime concerts. I can't actually remember which year. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. well, at least, well, maybe three or four years ago. Fantastic. Um, Paul, thank you so, so much. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more about that piece. We'll come back to it. But I think Sally has been waiting for so long in the wings. <laughs> Sally, your introduction got curtailed by Paul's enthusiasm for technical discussion, which we love. But first of all, Sally, <laughs> hello. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, where are you right now? Where are we looking at? I'm I'm in, in Hove. I'm, I'm actually a little bit kind of shell-shocked by that piece. It was just so mesmeric. I'm, I think I got into a zone, so it's hard to sort of come out again. It was, it was so beautiful. Uh, the, the, um, just daring to do that for so long. I, think, I just think that's fantastic and um, really created such an atmosphere. So yeah, sorry, I'm I'm, trying, I'm, I'm coming out now. <laughs> well, it, we don't have we don't have to come out because it's exactly what Paul was saying is that Ben, you've done something very daring here, which is make a piece with with very uh, small amounts of building blocks, but mm. you sustained it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, well but just playing it for the first time, you have a feeling about a piece that you've never had before. You know, I, you know, I was I was impressed by it, and I knew knew it was a good piece, but I couldn't tell how how it would actually feel until mm. actually playing it. Yeah, it's kind of strange to do in these circumstances to a completely you know, novel environment. Yeah. It's the same for me. It's kind of a strange piece where you you don't. Or when it was first performed, you think, "How's that going to work?" Or bef before I I heard uh, Zoe, who was the the viola the, the, the player who played it first. Rehearsing. Not me, a different Zoe, yeah. whose surname is so similar to mine that we occasionally get paid by the wrong person. <laughs> anyway, carry on. <laughs> but yeah, it's sort of it. it you wasn't quite sure structurally how that would work, but but in fact, it, it once you're inside it, it works because you're in you're sort of locked in there mm. uh, and enclosed by it. So I was quite pleased with how, in in, in essence, the atmosphere was sustained through the through the course of the piece. Also, Ben, you've constructed it. Each of those four impressions is sandwiched with an interlude. I had, uh, just saying that for the, for the punters at home. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very um, deliberate attempt to just make everything extremely defined. Um, and also the feeling that you're, you're sort of trapped inside it. You're always wrapped around. Every time you have something different, and you fall back onto the into the interlude passage and it's mm. like you you can't escape from it basically mm. and you don't necessarily want to but you you know the, the piece is keeping you trapped into the into the emotion of it rather than sort of passing from one impression to the other you're always falling backwards and always falling you know into the it's keeping it's almost like a reset of your of your uh of your brain um, before you hear another another impression. It reminded me of, of sleep in a way that, that you keep returning to this sort of breathing but then there, there are different then there's a very slightly different pacing and then you come back to the breathing again and it's it really is quite mesmeric. I do like sleeping so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sally, we'll come on to you now. So there you are in Hove. How are you coping in lockdown? I know you've been you've been supporting a uh, a venture to help uh, freelance musicians in lockdown, haven't you? Yes, I I wrote um, a, a short piece. I was asked to do it, but it's an organisation called Soundworld, and they they were commissioning very short pieces from various different composers, really to to support the performers. Um, who of course have been much more sort of brutally affected, um, certainly in the short term than composers have. But um, I was given my lineup of saxophone, percussion and piano, 
And then the next day after that, um, I heard that the father of my friend, Branford Marsalis, had died of COVID-19, Ellis Marsalis, uh, who was an incredible educator and enabler of, of young people in New Orleans and um, quite an extraordinary uh, artist and still very active. And it was such a shock and, and it, it just fell naturally into the form of a tribute. Um, and there's a, this is an active uh, fundraising uh, thing that's still going on, isn't it? I'm just, uh, people can access that. Yes, if it's they, just if the they same look up, Yeah, so if, they, if you look up Sound World, you'll get to the, you'll get to the Yes, fund. I mean, the recordings are still being made, so, and, and they're all distanced recordings, uh, which is, is a very odd way to work. I mean, I'm, I'm now playing the viola again. I had a long, uh, 25 years when I didn't touch a viola, um, and I... I have found it much easier actually to relate to the viola than than to my composing and it, it it's brought me to the realization that um more and more um my my inspiration for composing is is not so much the inspiration but the deadline you know the fear of of not getting there in time and if you take that away uh it, I mean it's really made it made me look at my motivation for for creating and um, for instance, that short piece for Soundworld came so naturally because it came out really from a, a very deep feeling of, of, of um, upset, you know, and, and so that it created music. But so often, um, I'm not saying that, that the inspiration doesn't come, but, but it's kind of the other way around. If you've got a lot of deadlines and, and people waiting for pieces, um, you've, you've got this kind of uh, craftsmanship thing that has to happen and you have to create the music and there's a particular occasion that you're creating it for and you're always very aware of that but um, on very few occasions have I written a piece of music without that just as a response to something and um, it's really making me look at, at the whole reason that we are composers performers which is really about communicating and um, I mean, we, we've been standing on our doorstep every Thursday playing um, Beatles and Bobby McFerrin and Irving Berlin and uh, the astonishment of our neighbours to find that they have professional musicians living in their road and actually to connect to that and, and, and they kind of move closer. And um, I, I don't know, it's just made me realise that, that um, we are doing what we do in order to communicate and, and the devastating thing has been... Um, that that feeling of contact with our audiences has been taken away. So it's all very well playing online and knowing that people can hear it and, and they can respond, so, like in this initiative, which is fantastic because people can respond. Um, but actually to take away that feeling of live communication is, is really taking away some of one's life blood as a performer and also as a composer. So um, I have to say I sunk into a kind of despondent patch for several weeks when I just I, I had to regroup and I think we're all going to come out of this different of course we are and those parameters will have shifted forever and it sounds as though some really positive things have come out of this as well for you and you're re re-examining your whole motivation for doing what you're doing it's yeah. really interesting um so it seems very appropriate that now we're going to hear a viola piece now that you're returning to playing so i'm going to hand over to paul who i know has got burning questions for you before he <laughs> plays your piece paul well before questions i just want to say what what how pleased i am to be playing a piece of sally's because years years ago we used to sit together in the london symphonietta playing together, I seem to remember Cosi Fan Tutti. That's right, yes, yes. <laughs> and and then, then she disappeared up to Scotland and became a composer and I hardly ever saw her. But she's yeah. also probably the living composer who's written more for the viola than anybody else. There's two concertos, innumerable solo pieces, rivaling even Hindemith. <laughs> it's actually three concertos. <laughs> it's, it's strange because three. I... See, None of my viola music has been written with myself in mind and uh, certainly if I'd known there was any danger that I might have to play any of it, I, I would have written it very differently. <laughs> my viola parts are getting noticeably simpler these days, because, just in case. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but also in those Sinfonietta days, um, uh, Ollie Nussen was conducting a lot and I, there was one particularly significant tour when I was playing and... Um, 
he invited me to bring some scores for him to look at. So it was it was like a course of lessons. So every train journey in between each concert, he would look at another score and, and give me advice. And it was just absolutely incredible. And um, I was just looking at this score and, and realizing that I, I have continued to use um, a particular way of, of arranging notes that he showed me and which helped me to find a voice and a, and a way of being confident in my writing. Um, just a very simple scheme of, of just taking four or five pitches and arranging them in a grid so that they make melodic and harmonic material. Well, that's really very evident in the piece, actually, as I was saying earlier, because you, you're taking very simple cells and built something very, very strong from it. And, and it's one of those things where everywhere you look, you think, oh, yes, that's, that's connected to that, that's connected to that. And the whole thing really, really hangs together, in my mind. It's, it's certainly felt that way when learning the piece, and it's because it's, it's vital to find, find some structure and logic in a piece when yes, you're practicing I think it. That... Otherwise, you, it's impossible to make decisions about it. Yes, I think there has to be some element um, no, of expectation it's, it's, in, when you're listening to a piece of music for the first time, or, or indeed playing it. Yeah. That if 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 you don't if you have no idea what's going to come next, you actually get quite bored because you 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 stop participating in in yeah. the music. Um, it's it's like in a in a, mm. a drama, you know, a theatre or, or whatever. That that if if you stop caring what's going to happen to the characters, or if you stop understanding what the plot is then you're not going to be surprised by anything because anything could happen and then it becomes boring really. So yes. um, I think it's very yeah. important to, to create a world where the audience has some expectation of what might happen and then, and then you can play with that, then mm. you can go against it or work with it. Mm. Exactly. Now this is based on or inspired by a, a very ancient poem. Would you like to tell us about Yes, it's a, it's a pre-Islamic it's, it's poem. it's very evocative. Mm. Um, yes, it's by a poet called um, Al-Kansa, who was um, a pre-Islamic uh, female poet. And um, she wrote several poems about the death of her brothers who were killed in conflict. And um, it came from an anthology that my mother gave me, actually, which was from the uh, Cambridge Women's Peace Collective, I think. And I've often gone back to this book to find um, inspiration and motivation for, for music. Um, and I, I'm noticing from the date that this was written, that it, it was written um, just after the, the start of the war in Iraq. And I think that's quite significant in, in 2003. And it's dedicated, it, it says at the top, for peace. It's interesting coming coming back to music, which I hadn't really, I haven't, I don't think I've heard it played since the premiere, which was in Japan, um, played by Masuo Kawasaki in Tokyo in 2003. So it's it's been fantastic to work on it again and 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 really to rediscover it because it's it's enough enough time has gone by for me to look at it really as if um, I'm looking at the work of of another composer. Well, I think uh, it's time that we heard it. Yeah, I think it's time we yeah. go for it. So um, this is uh, That Recent Earth by Sally Beamish.
thank you so much, Paul Silverthorne. That was That Recent Earth by Sally Beamish. Thank you very, very much, Paul. Um, we have uh, a few questions that have popped in from the YouTube chat. So we'll go through those and uh, we'll be talking, of course, more about this piece as we go. Working backwards, um, Laura Bowler. Hello, Laura. Um, has um, asked about uh, text as a basis for what you do, Sally. First of all, she said, could you read the poem? Um, we could probably quote a bit of that. And secondly, she's asking Sally, she's very curious about the creative process of text as a, as a starting point for a piece and how that then transforms into music for different composers. Could you talk a little bit about this aspect of your process? Well, I have to say that um, when when I first started uh, writing uh, to commission, so that was when I was sort of 30-ish, I had never written anything longer than about eight minutes. And what really helped me to expand into larger uh, structures was a commission to write um, incidental music for a set of poems by Irina Ratushinskaya. And I asked if I could actually make this into a piece. So what I did was I wrote music, as if I was writing film music, I wrote music to be behind the reading of each poem and then I wrote interludes in between. And, and you know, as we were talking about earlier, that gives a, a, a really good structure. Um, and I found I'd written a piece of 15 minutes and that gave me such confidence. And also having the poem as a starting point, a bit like seeing a film, you know, you, you kind of know what to do because you know what the poem is, is triggering inside you. and, and so it gives you your, your ideas to, to a large extent. And then quite soon after that, I was asked to write a violin sonata. No, no um, words involved. But I decided to set a poem by Sylvia Plath, for, for whom you can't get copyright anyway. She said, <laughs> you, can't, you can't set her words for singers anyway. Um, so uh, I set a poem of hers called Winter Trees for the violin. So I followed the, the, the shape of the, of the poem. Um, and then also had interludes where I was expressing the sentiments in the poem. So again, it gave me not only a structure, but in this case, it gave me melodies. And and in this particular poem that that that, that recent earth is based on, um, there are several um, refrains in the poem, and it actually it's called for her brother, and it actually begins weep, weep, weep. So there and and this comes back. So that there, there are. There, there's that that kind of refrain that, that comes back and um, there are also lots of um, uh, very evocative uh, almost sound pictures so life is a buzz of hornets about a lance point and I mean that that to me just said um, viola near the bridge to get that sort of glassy buzzy sound and and tremolo which is when you move the bow very fast um, so things like that. So there, there are often pictures in poetry. But more recently, um, I'm, I'm married to a, a playwright who's also an actor, and I've got him to read poems to me, and recorded them on, on my phone, and then actually notated the, the very patterns of his voice reading the poem. So I, I did a, a Yeats, um, The Wild Swans at Cool. I got him to read the poem to me, and then I notated it. For, for violin and, and piano. So it's it gives you such a fantastic template. Um, Sally, isn't it true to say that seventh century Arabic poets, uh, female poets, their job was to write poems for mourning, for grief, that was yes. their specific. So that's the underpinning of this one. Yes, it's, it's very much, and that recent earth is the earth that's just been put onto the corpse, you know, so recently, and it's, it's really raw with grief this poem it's um uh, it, it it's quite heartbreaking to read thanks so much for that question laura very very interesting sally um we've got one for you ben now welcome back to the fold and this is from claire dolding claire thanks for sending in this question um so yeah she said sally it's so interesting to hear about the inspiration behind your composing and your desire to connect with people that you were talking about earlier on ben does this resonate with you? Um, this uh, what what inspires you to compose? Um, 
I, I think I've I've never been able to actually take external inspirations particularly well. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but um, obviously if, if I'm doing a, a song, it, it's, it's going to be directly related to the, the text, of course. Um, but that's a very specific uh, situation. Um, and in that sense, I suppose what I try and do is to, is to recreate, is to find the fundamental atmosphere of the poem. Um, in the same way that I suppose I approach the piece for the, the viola is that you start with a, a specific atmosphere and then expand it. So in a song, I'll do the same thing. Um, I'll find what atmosphere represents the poem uh, which could be a chord or a, a melody, um, but it's probably more likely to be something harmonic. Um, and then I kind of, and then it's a case of, I almost forget about the poem and what's happening in it. And it's a case of expanding out from the atmosphere that I've created whilst taking into account, obviously the flow of the poem. Um, but when we go to pieces that don't have any words in them, then I've, always found it difficult to take external um, influences or uh, I'm not, not quite sure why. I think I tend to um, fold quite heavily back in on the imagination and always, I'm always looking for something that comes directly from nowhere in, in some respects. Mm. Um, and it's not necessarily a... a uh, conscious decision. I mean, I, I think I've tried to do stuff in the past that in, is inspired by things, but I've never found a way of actually developing a piece through an external inspiration because I've, in my in my sort of the way that I compose, I feel sort of trapped by the the inspiration. So in some ways, I, it, the the way I work is a rejection of everything that's outside and a kind of folding in on your own imagination and then trying to find some way of drawing that back out again. We've got another question for you, Ben, which is sort of leading on from what you're talking about. And this is from Lara Poe. Hello, Lara, um, another composer. I love it. All the composers are lining up today. Um, she's got a question in two parts. Actually, earlier on, she was commenting about your approach to quarter tones and how interesting she finds that as a harmonic approach and she's saying from what I can hear you're also using the quarter tone material in a melodic way to develop the initial cell is that how you saw it when you were working yes I mean uh, I started using quarter tones in um, a little bit later than than maybe some other composers especially well especially living in France now that everyone everyone throws them all over the place um, but maybe sort of 10 years ago or so, I started to work out how I wanted to use them. If I was going to, I, I really enjoyed the sound and especially being inspired by composers such as Griset, who, who, where the sound, where the quarter tones are inherent part of the sound, there's no decoration. It's all, it's all a note there for, for its own merit rather than just sort of coloring to make a sludgy effect or a, a beautiful effect. It's a very specific uh, melodic or harmonic intention, um, which creates a sound that you wouldn't hear normally. So for me, that that's that was incredibly incredibly important. And I think one of the first pieces I did was some songs for saxophone and soprano. Um, well, I don't think the soprano sings many quarter tones, but the the saxophone obviously can play them quite easily. So. Have, the piece became a, a sort of exploration of how to really create uh, harmony that works and resonances that work and also melodic lines that work as well. Um, and the same in this piece, yeah, I think uh, the, the quarter tones are there to create all the material, whether it's harmonic or, or melodic. Um, and I think... Uh, once you start doing that, it, it sort of, it puts you in a certain frame of mind where it's actually quite hard to get out of it. <laughs> Whereas, you know, if I, if I have to write a piece for voice and piano, suddenly you're, you're thrown into a world where you could make the singer try and sing quarter tones, but I'm not particularly keen on that idea. Um, so 
it, it's sort of you you have to sort of almost reinvent your language when you're moving to a, a back into a system where you can't put them in again I think that locked in hypnotic quality is what everyone's really responded to in that piece. Mm. And a lot of people, by the way, are saying that it was it was resonating with them for a long time afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's a hit. Um, Lara's given us um, a second question, which I'm going to start off um, to Paul, which is how have you all found working on Zoom and other video platforms when rehearsing issues like latency, interesting changes in acoustics and all of that? Paul, how have you found it? Well, I haven't done any rehearsing this way and uh, I've been teaching and I haven't been using Zoom for that but uh, it's quite frustrating because I, I know my students make a better sound than, than it than comes across there so I think as I was talking to you earlier I often get them to send a recording earlier before the lesson so that I've heard it properly and then I know what I'm working with. I'm sure it's going to get better because there's such a demand for it now. We've created the virus has created a demand for much better audio and video stuff. But uh, um, it's it's frustrating and it's it's frustrating not being face to face with students. Um, but, but in some cases, there's a greater concentration. Um, on the window, that there are no other distractions. Right, working, you're just in this zone, but it's actually it's quite tiring, and exhausting. More preparation. And your audio is breaking up now, Maybe just to sort of on. demonstrate this problem. <laughs> ah, I thought you were, I thought you were looking a bit. Well, we were listening to these fascinating, this sort of change of latency in the audio that Laura was talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. We've got what you're yeah, we've got what you're talking about. And Paul, just hoping that your audio is still going to work. How has it been for you performing these very intense solo pieces without a visible audience? How's that for you? Oh, We've lost him. You see, it's all demonstrated. Oh, what a shame. Sorry, Paul. I'm going to just I'm going to just ask Sally now this Zoom question because you were saying when we were chatting. OK, come back to me. Yes, we'll come back to you, Paul, um, just while Zoom is working itself out. Yeah, maybe I'll go off and come back in, see if that helps. Oh, we can hear you perfectly now. This is our life now, isn't it, everybody? <laughs> You're frozen. They haven't. Sally, you were saying a bit earlier that you were having these wonderful experiences on Zoom. Right, okay. Um, yourself with Quaker meetings. Yes, I discovered Zoom before uh -huh. my children, so they they were very impressed. No, Although our it. first family so Zoom meeting, it, it was only yeah. a couple of seconds before they discovered all the all the things you could do with Zoom, like putting yourself in front of the Golden Gate Bridge, and you know, the Quakers <laughs> hadn't hadn't really done that in the meetings, but. But you said there was something very beautiful about seeing all of these boxes of people just being really quiet with their audio yes. off. Yes, everyone's muted. So if you do want to say something, you unmute. But um, otherwise, you're, it's just totally peaceful. And I, I just find that hour on a Sunday morning is very necessary, actually. Just just sitting there with, with other quiet people. Yeah, and an opposite from making music. And Ben, you said earlier that actually you're not really using Zoom at all. <laughs> How You're very techy, Ben. I'm imagining that for you, the lockdown tech challenge hasn't been quite as bad as for a lot of the rest of us. Um, well, I haven't really needed any technology, so it's not too bad. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm working, well, I've got my computer here and all my normal equipment for, for working, but... Um, yeah, it hasn't really, hasn't really changed anything. But I haven't used anything different, no, because the only thing we need to, I suppose, use is more communicating tools, but um, I tend to use the phone and FaceTime and stuff like that. Well, folks, we are coming close towards the end of the show. So I'm just going to have a quick scroll through um, to see if I've missed any people out. Um, there's a lot of uh, fan mail for your hoodie, Ben. Um, <laughs> then uh, I think um, John Osborne has said it's a wonderful piece. Ben, your piece that was earlier on before we uh, heard it, 
heard uh, Sally, so bravo. Um, Paul, there's a load of a praise coming in for you. Everyone's saying how fabulous you are. Great stuff. Thank Julian you. Jacobson, hello, Julian, um, saying, how about Gothenburg <laughs> Waltz as an encore? A fabulous <laughs> idea. Um, and yeah, general praise from everyone, a very interesting set of pieces. So that just brings me to thank you so much to Ben Foskett and Sally Beamish for your beautiful pieces and to Paul Silverthorne for performing them so amazingly in this very strange Zoom universe that we're all living in. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, everybody, for your questions, your comments, for being here. The very last episode in the shorts series is going to be next Wednesday, at the usual time of 3 p.m. And it's going to feature John Morton, the leader of Symphonietta, violinist Jonathan Morton. And he's going to be playing pieces of music by Tom Colt and Caroline Shaw. We'd love to see you there. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>